Welcome to the Manfred Olson Planetarium's virtual program. This is part of our celebration of Earth Week. After all, the more we study of the cosmos, the more we appreciate the very planet that we live in. I'm very happy to present Prasenjit Gupta Sarma's uh, whole team who is working on solutions that are going to benefit our whole society, we hope, um, in terms of finding solutions for storing energy. Um, to that end, I would like to just have uh, Victoria Robinson, our, our assistant director, give us a few uh, pointers as to how to use the question feature so that uh, people can answer these questions as they come or at the end as, as they see fit. So first of all, I'd like to thank Abrasenjit for being here today. And uh, Victoria, can you just give us a quick up, um, a, a quick kind of reminder of how the question and answer works? Yeah, so you're gonna have a chat box um, available, but we'd like, if you have a question, we'd like you to put it in the Q&A button. So there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and it just makes it easier for us to collect all the questions there. Um, so if as um, Dr. Gupta Sarma or his team, as they're talking, if you think of a question, you're welcome to click on that Q&A button and submit your question. And we will periodically probably go through them or maybe wait till the end and uh, answer them then. So that's all I've got. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so. Prasenjit, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Victoria and Jean. And this is uh, wonderful to be here on a, uh, on a nice evening here in Milwaukee. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, rechargeable batteries. And um, the, so this is something that we all use all the time. In fact, every, the, the, most likely the laptop that you're listening from, uh, the phone that you have in your pocket, uh, the car that you drive, pretty much everything runs on rechargeable batteries nowadays. So we'll talk a little bit about what these batteries are. And because this is in celebration of Earth Day or Earth Week uh, at the planetarium, we will talk a little bit about what we're doing when we, um, when we you know, buy and use and try to throw away or recycle batteries. And as we do that, we will talk about um, you know, the challenge that we face and why it is important to do this kind of research. And we'll talk a little bit about the kind of work we do with science here. We're not going to talk a lot about science and engineering. We'll talk mostly about the importance of this research. So, uh, so we'll talk about new sodium ion batteries. So why sodium ion batteries? We'll talk about that in a bit, but most of the batteries that are in your systems today are lithium ion batteries. In fact, there are no sodium ion batteries in the market right now. So uh, let me introduce myself. I am Prasenjit Neil Gupta Sarma. Most people on campus call me PG. I'm a professor of physics with some appointments, uh, concurrent appointments in uh, engineering as well. So um, I am. Uh, I wanted to introduce to you the students who are panelists today. My students in the uh, in my research group, um, Bill Rexhausen. Uh, just wave if you have your video on. Uh, he's a PhD student. Uh, there is. Uh, we have Christian Parsons, who is also a PhD student. He's a candidate. Bill and Christian are candidates. Nilufar Yavarishad, who's a candidate for PhD as well. Heather Pace, who's as well a PhD student. So these, these four people are working in the lab on various aspects of, of uh, electronic materials. And we have three undergraduates also from this lab, from my lab, Alex Eben, Mason Williams, and Marcus Morin, all uh, SURF students. SURF is, uh, is a great opportunity that UWM provides for um, undergraduates to do research and they pay uh, students by the hour to work with a, um, uh, a professor or a researcher on campus. So we were talking about new sodium ion batteries, but before I talk about that, I just want to set the stage a bit in, uh, to, you know, in view of the fact that we're talking about Earth Day. We are, um, our lab was in the old physics building on campus. Some of you who have been on campus before and walked around here. Uh, and on the bottom left, you can see uh, the Manfred Olson Planetarium of uh, where Jean and Victoria work. 
Um, and we started this lab in around 2001. And then we moved out from that lab to a new building, which is what you'll see very close to that old building. It's at the Kenwood, Kenwood Interdisciplinary Research Center, a research complex, which is, um, we moved around 2015 or 17, and which is where most of our work gets done. If you want to come by and take a look anytime, you're welcome. Write to me, write to anybody here, and we'll show you the lab. So let's talk about electronic materials. And let's talk about um, uh, stuff that goes into our equipment and our laptops and our batteries and our everything else that we use today, this, this new world that we are in. Now we know that all this, most of us know that all this comes from silicon, but there's lots of other elements from the periodic table. Uh, some you may have heard of if you are a chemist or a physicist, but some you might not have heard of. So there's beryllium, and you see, as you go from the left, there's beryllium, there's palladium, bismuth, copper, niobium, lithium, and then gallium cobalt. You can see cobalt from Africa. We'll talk about it a little bit. And now here you see that um, uh, uh, the green ones are where these things are sourced. And the yellow dot there is where most things are taken from where they're sourced and sourced and where they're produced, in, made manufactured into equipment. Notice there's just one dot in the United States, which is a matter of concern we're gonna talk about. And also notice that a lot of the production is happening out here in, in, on the um, Eastern side of the, of the world um, across the Atlantic. And that's another concern for us because suppose there were uh, a, a, for some reason, either a pandemic or a geopolitical conflict or anything which severed or, or closed the ties between these, these spaces, we would be basically out of luck because we wouldn't have either, we would have neither the sources nor the manufacturing to run our economy here in the US. So that leads me to the question of what's, what's called the supply chain risk. And as you look into these technologies, the batteries, there's fuel cells, wind, traction motors. Um, these are photovoltaics that we put on top of our, our um, houses. Uh, there's robotics, drones, 3D, all of these depend on materials. And uh, on the left side are how high the supply risk for this is. So if you no notice here, supply risk for batteries is about the highest right? And uh, renewable energy is also pretty high there. And there's, I'll, I won't go through all of them here, but you can see basically the periodic table and what we call typically rare earth metals that are hard to find, um, not found as much in the US or we haven't started mining them, and also um, very important in the supply chain. Now there's also the issue of e-waste that we barely think about. Most of us recycle uh, our, um, uh, our paper and our plastic and our glass, but we don't always think about what we're doing when we buy a, a battery and throw it out in the garbage. So I wanted to ask, I'm gonna keep asking questions to my uh, panel here. So Mason, uh, recently through the i program of the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center, you talked to a lot of people um, and got some information about what did you, about this, what did you learn from interviews with consumers about whether the quality of the environment, the quality of planet Earth is important to them? Talk to us a little bit. Uh, yeah. So uh, when I did my interview, I found that a lot of the people that were environmentally conscious, those that would go out of their way to recycle things at external facilities like recycling plants or uh, batteries plus, um, that they still valued convenience over uh, the planet. And uh, so while they may go out of their way to recycle things, uh, they'll uh, tend to spend a little more money on things that they can just throw out, uh, which is really good for us. Thanks, Mason. Mason is an undergrad in the, in the, in the first or second year, the first year, I think, uh, working in the lab. And some time ago, uh, we did just a month ago or so, we worked with Brian and his colleagues to run a what's called the NSF National Science Foundation i program. And everybody here in, participated in that. It was a great time. We talked to a lot of people um, and interviewed them as to you know, where things are going as far as battery uh, manufacturing and battery um, needs in the country are concerned. So here you notice that electronic waste is produced in the green areas and deposited or recycled or processed in the red areas. And obviously the global north and the global south so a lot of most of the use, of course, the other countries also use it, but most of the use is in North America and Western Europe. 
And then we dump all of that waste into Mexico, into uh, Brazil, into Eastern Europe, China, India. Most of it goes to China. In fact, recently China said that we won't take your waste. Um, and you know we don't quite know where to put waste. In fact, some of us don't, I think I heard that we don't quite know where to put our regular recyclables that we put, you know, that the, that the village and the city uh, um, collects for us. And in fact, Thailand recently enacted a ban against importation of electronic waste. So this is a big issue because we produce electronic waste at a very large, you know, very large quantity here in the United States and most countries as well. And we don't really know where to put them. So I told you I'll talk about batteries. So let me switch a little bit to batteries and then talk about that. So a battery, most of you know what that is, something that gives you electronic charge to run, let's say a flashlight. So if you took in this picture, I have a simple battery that you might have bought in a, in a store. And if you pass that through wires that are conducting here, it's you show copper because copper is a good conductor of electricity and then connect that to a lamp, which we call a load, then you'll get a light from it. Now, this does not work too well because eventually the battery just runs out and then you have to throw it away, generating electronic waste, generating a lot of other problems, um, but mostly that you have to go out and buy and pay for these batteries. So some years ago, about 25 years ago, a guy called John Goodenough in Texas suggested that we could create rechargeable batteries. Actually rechargeable batteries have been around for a while, but what John Goodenough suggested was using lithium to make rechargeable batteries. So here's a cartoon to show you how some of these things work. So essentially, those of you who remember from high school chemistry, oxidizing and reducing, that's what a battery is doing. So let me just run uh, this video for a bit while I'm talking. So uh, when you're depleting a battery, then you're oxidizing it. You have, you have electrons that go from one end of the battery, we call it the cathode, and to the other end, which is called the anode, and electrons are just flowing from one end to the other and then going out into the circuit that you want to energize. Now, what, I, what this red thing is supposed to show is that, well, the battery is out here, so what do you do now? And here's where rechargeable batteries come in. So what rechargeable batteries do, which is what is in most of your equipment, is that they give you a method to reverse that flow of charge from the cathode to the anode, one of the ends of the battery to the other end. And um, what they let you do is to recharge it. So here is what happens. So you want to, to um, let me make sure this is plain. Okay, so you want to plug it in. When you plug it in, the electrons and the charge carriers basically move back to where they were. And then when you disconnect and start using it, you can then use like in this case, a laptop, but eventually it runs out and then you have to plug it back in. So this is where we are at in terms of rechargeable batteries. Now that the trick is how do we get these electrons or charges, positive and, or, and negative charges to move from one end of the battery to the other. And this is where lithium comes in or has come in so far. So, so we went through what actually happens. Electrons come out of the battery, move from one end of the battery inside the battery to the other end, and then eventually run out. And if you want to recharge them, you would be then sending uh, those electrons back. And I don't know why it's slow here, but um, you would send them back. And then you would get the, um, the battery to charge again, which means electrons would go back and then be available to do what you need to do again. So let's now move on to um, a question to one of my panel members. And I'm going to bring in um, Bill and Christian here. So one of the problems that we face with these rechargeable batteries is that the, as the charges moves, move from one end to the other, they face resistance. That is, they have to, uh, they have to overcome some energy barriers in order to move. So um, Christian, tell us a little bit, if you would, about why internal resistance of a battery, that internal resistance of a battery can affect its capacity to, de to deliver power. Christian. Sure, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll just start really quickly by saying like where that internal resistance actually comes from since we just looked at that uh, video. Uh, so when we're actually like using a battery, either charging or discharging, like we saw, the electrolyte that's inside your battery is actually chemically reacting with both the cathode side and the anode side of the battery. 
uh, and this chemical reaction is going to be forming some uh, thin layer on the cathode and the anode, which people typically will call a solid electrolyte layer. Uh, and this is going to cause an increase in the internal resistance, like uh, PG just said. And it also uh, decreases the amount of usable electrolyte and cathode material as well. So it's kind of a double, a double whammy. It creates a, a big problem. Uh, so when we have this increase in internal, internal resistance, we end up dissipating power inside the battery. Right? So that's bad. We want to dissipate it outside rather than inside. Uh, this will cause the battery to kind of heat up and also degrade the battery over time. And this is kind of a problem that we've been uh, looking at working on in our lab. And I'll just say what we've, we've done so far. Uh, so we created a few new algorithms and developed some software to model this internal uh, impedance of actual batteries that we create and study in our lab. And the goal of that is to hopefully understand um, how to reduce this process in the batteries that we create or just in batteries in general. Thanks, Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of Christian's PhD thesis and the work that he's doing involves understanding the internal resistance. So let's move on to why lithium, right? Why do most rechargeable batteries use lithium? Um, and uh, some of you might know that the non-rechargeable batteries can use, you know, cadmium and things like that, which are also toxic, but lithium is what we use currently. So let's go through what the problems are with the current lithium ion batteries that all of us use. One of those, those is overheating, that they heat very easily. And when they heat up beyond a certain temperature, they're flammable. And you might've heard about how lithium ion batteries catch fire, sometimes in an airplane, sometimes next to where you're sleeping and so on. So there's a lot of um, problems like these that are involved in, uh, in lithium ion batteries. We overcome them, we meaning as, as a group of scientists and engineers around the world, overcome them by using a computer program on the battery, um, which controls the amount of the, the, how high a temperature can go, how much current can flow through, and by what's called a battery management system. And by doing that, we try to stop these systems from, from going through sort of a, a, um, a flammable situation. Um, and, but then there are other problems with lithium ion batteries. One of those is that they use cobalt and extraction of cobalt is a big problem. We'll talk about it a little bit. And using it in recycling is a big problem as well. And, and, and it, additionally, cobalt is very, very expensive. So this, this the 50% of the cost of a battery is, about, is the cost of cobalt and lithium. Now, as I showed you a little while ago, the supply chain where we get these lithium and cobalt from are completely dependent on other countries. They're very expensive. And we do not have currently lithium that we are able to extract from the ground or from lakes in, in the USA. And we don't have cobalt almost none at all. Now we might find some, but currently there is none that we're extracting. Not only are we getting the materials from them, as I mentioned earlier, we produce these batteries um, overseas. This is a big security risk because uh, even our electric grid is backed up. That is the computers that run our electric grid are backed up with, um, with um, um, lithium ion batteries. Um, and so this is a big risk if, if there are problems with the supply chain and so on. And then finally, there is this social, social cost of cobalt mining, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It, it, it is basically killing people as we mine cobalt. So let's talk about you know, how much lithium exists. Um, it can be found in many parts of the world. Currently, most of it comes from what's called the lithium triangle, which is the triangle between Bolivia, Chile, Chile and Argentina. That's where most of our lithium comes from. There is a little bit of backup in Australia, a little bit in, in the United States, but right now that's where it comes from. Now, you might have heard that Bolivia went through a huge political um, uprising recently. A lot of that was based on just the fact that they are our um, lithium ion, our lithium suppliers. And so there's a, there's a fight, let's call it a fight basically of who will control re lithium reserves. And people have figured out, countries have figured out that whoever has control of, of these reserves of these uh, valuable met metals and materials will basically control the energy future. So 
let's also go through a little bit about the value chain of the lithium ion battery. So where it comes from. So basically it, it's mining, it's mined, it's refined, cathodes are produced, cells are produced, modules are assembled, and then we put them into manufacturers or equipment manufacturers like a Tesla car, for example, so, or, or any hybrid car. So one interesting point here is that sometimes when we drive a hybrid, we say, hey, I'm trying to save the earth, right? Because I'm trying to put less um, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide into the, into the earth's atmosphere. The question we should ask ourselves very carefully is, are we really saving the earth? Yes, we're saving global warming for sure, but what are we doing elsewhere? Um, so let's go back to the um, procurement focus. So um, China, and uh, which, which is where a lot of the things are produced. And um, we are, so there were some places where we knew how to find them. And now the, those places are also changing because we're depleting where we find these materials. The recycling market is also an issue. And uh, right now we are in a situation where we might be able to recycle more lithium and cobalt from cities than from the ground because cities where we are buying all the stuff and throwing them into the garbage, that's where uh, most of our, the lithium and the cobalt that we need is sitting. So we are somehow able to recycle things and pull the lithium and the cobalt and other um, uh, expensive metals from our equipment, then we might actually be able to save ourselves um, from this uh, you know, future where, where we don't have enough to run. Let's go, talk about cobalt a bit, another thing that goes into lithium ion batteries. So cobalt comes from the, the Republic of Congo, and the, what, what we call the Congo, there's a basin there. And that's currently the only major source of, of, of cobalt, a very expensive material. And part of the reason it's expensive is that that's only where it is, but the, these countries don't actually benefit from it. The other countries which, um, which have uh, you know, ownership of these reserves are who benefit from it. But the problem with using it is that it uses child labor. It uses people mining for cobalt with their hands. It's a very toxic material. Um, we have, this is an aerial view of a, of a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood in the DRC uh, in 2016. This is what's going on. I mean, this is 2016, not too long ago. Um, so people living here, right? Houses, normal places of, the, of uh, like a suburban part of Kasulo. And this is what it looks like in 2019. So in three years, we have, we collectively, the whole world, right? Uh, has have, have basically destroyed this residential neighborhood and we are mining for cobalt with, with our hands. Um, you know, and this is what it, that same picture looks like in 2019. So I want to bring a couple of my uh, panel members here. Um, so, Heather, I wanted to ask you, during the i program, you talked with some battery manufacturers and suppliers. And consumers know, that is not, not consumers like regular consumers like you and me, but consumers who, um, who uh, source materials from other countries and who help manufacture back batteries. They know that cobalt is bad, it's toxic, it's expensive and that reducing cobalt could slightly compromise the quality of a battery. That is, as we reduce the amount of cobalt we put in the battery, the amount of energy that it can store goes down, the rate at which it can deliver energy goes down. Heather, what did you learn about consumers and manufacturers during your interviews? So, yeah, thanks. Um, I was surprised at how conscious companies were of the issues surround, surrounding cobalt. So working in engineering for many years, all we cared about was money. And so I, I kind of came into this just thinking that all of the large companies that we talked to were just gonna have that same kind of shtick. Like, yeah, it's bad, but it's the best we got and, and everything was about money. And what I discovered and was very surprised by, it's really not about money right now. It's about lead times, how quickly they can get something. And what I was most surprised about what I started with is um, large companies, even though they might be compromising um, 
quality in a battery, the lower the cobalt, the better. And a lot of companies were working on making batteries that just had less and less cobalt, finding ways to do that. And then they were running into other issues where they were using nickel and then there's uh, issues with lead time and nickel. Um, but uh, speaking to a, a battery manufacturer, um, what they told us was that very large companies, so companies like Ford, for instance, were sending over requests for quotes specifically requiring that the batteries had very little cobalt. So this tells us, thanks Heather, um, this tells us that people are getting worried about it. Um, at the same time, some of the interviews that I was doing, I learned that people are willing to compromise on this, but they're not willing to compromise on the performance of the battery. Uh, that is, they still want batteries that perform just like the lithium ion batteries with cobalt in it, but that um, you know they still at the same time would like to reduce cobalt because I think people who buy cars and so on, uh, someone who drives a hybrid, for example, cares about the environment, uh, but they, at the same time, they are, um, you know, they, they are becoming aware of the fact that, that to run this sort of a um, high advanced, um, highly advanced engineering supported, physics supported uh, economy, we are really, you know, on the one hand, we are caring for the planet. On the other hand, we are depleting the planet. Just, just by putting large batteries in our cars. So this is a question that it's got, it's a wicked problem. It's a difficult problem to solve, um, but you know, what solutions can we get? And we'll talk a little bit about that. So here's another picture of a child digging with their hands um, on the side of a mountain in that Congo basin. And then they pick up these pieces and they sell them for, I don't know, 10 cents, 20 cents. And then somebody takes them over and extracts the cobalt from that. Um, if they don't come to work, uh, in fact, some of their uh, read stories where they're, um, you know, tox uh, poisoned by some of the things that they're doing, especially when they go deep into the mines. And uh, as usual, uh, they're forgotten. You know, some of them get very sick, some of them die. Um, we need to think about this and, and people such as we who, uh, who understand the physics of these things and who understand what to put into these materials uh, are uh, now becoming aware of it. And uh, what, that's one of the goals of my lab to figure out the sustainable solutions to these complex problems. Here's another example of children picking up uh, um, stones from this is cobalt stones, cobalt based stones. Um, most likely they look greenish and they're greenish bluish tinges. And they, uh, they pick them up and then they get, you know, a few, few maybe a few cents for it, not even that. Uh, so eating out a living. So this is, so we, for a while, for the last few years, about seven years now, uh, maybe more, we started thinking, can we not replace lithium and cobalt with other things and still get a battery that works? So uh, an important thing about replacing lithium with sodium, uh, one, one thing that you know, I'll remind you from your um, chemistry class in high school, uh, if you have been there. I mean, some of you are much younger, but let me just go through it. If you look at the first um, group, the first um, column, you'll see hydrogen on top, and then you'll see lithium here, and then you'll see sodium here. So one of the things about the periodic table is that as you go down in this column, the chemical properties remain very similar. I say similar, not the same. And we won't go into chemistry class here, but in principle, lithium and sodium should work the same way, right? But there is a problem. The problem is that lithium is, the, 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 the more you go toward the top, the smaller the atom. So lithium is a very tiny atom. And this is why it's able to go shuttle back and forth between the cathode and the anode, the picture that I showed you a little while ago. But if lithium is so difficult and has so many problems, then could we replace that with sodium? And that's a challenge for us. Uh, so sodium, as, you, as I said, is in the same column and but it is larger. So we need to devise methods that can take this larger material and shuttle them back and forth. And that's where the, uh, the secret sauce lies. That's where our uh, knowledge of, of physics and chemistry and solid state physics and so on come in. So 
I want to tell you on the right side of this to tell you that when we take out sodium from what are called brine lakes, salt, brine means salt water. So we take from saltwater lakes, we of course produce both lithium and sodium. That's how we get lithium. In fact, in Bolivia, there is lakes with lithium and sodium in them. About a teaspoon of lithium, right, is what we get, let's say, and we get large hills of sodium. So amount of lithium available versus amount of sodium available is huge. So sodium is extremely abundant. And you know, sodium is in your table salt, so it's really cheap. So the question was, oh, by the way, I should say that you couldn't really put lithium in a teaspoon like that because it's gonna catch fire right away. But you could put sodium in a teaspoon. It'll not, not catch fire right away. Um, so it's a little bit safer. But um, because of its abundance, the cost is much, much lower. And you know, we'll probably never out of, run out of sodium in this, on this planet. So here are the values of working with sodium and creating a sodium ion battery. It's lower in cost, it's abundant, a spelling problem there. There's a supply chain reliability, right? We know where to find sodium. We have sodium here in the US. It's sustainable, we'll never run out of it. It's safer because it doesn't catch fire so easily. So we believe that this is the next generation technology and uh, we have successfully created sodium ion batteries that work almost as good as well as lithium ion batteries. So we have sodium ion batteries that, for example, the amount of energy that they can um, hold is approximately 85 to 95 percent of what a lithium ion battery can hold. Now, 85, 90 percent is not yet acceptable um, because you know people still want the cars and so on to work, run the same way. For example, if I were if I were to tell you I'm selling you a laptop and the battery in the laptop instead of running for eight hours will run for six hours or seven hours, you'd probably say, "Sorry, I'm not interested. I need the big." The laptop that runs for a long time because I need to take long flights or whatever. So uh, we're still uh, working on this part, but we do have sodium ion batteries that we have made and tested that work um, uh, almost as I was saying, 80 to 90 percent, actually 85 to 95 percent as well as, uh, as lithium ion batteries. So the, um, uh, the, we're waiting for the situation right now to when battery companies are going to say, we don't find lithium anymore or the cost has gone up significantly that we need to compromise on that a little bit and switch to sodium. So we are poised at a point where I think we will have sodium ion batteries very soon in our, um, in our appliances. So this is a picture where I wanted to say why we use lithium instead of sodium. So as I mentioned, the sodium is the charge that's going back and forth between one end of the battery to the other end. So this is the inside of a battery. And we have various things like we might have iron, nickel, manganese, cobalt, whatever that we put here, which um, then help the sodium or the lithium back and forth between this uh, crystal structure. So these little balls are atoms that have been formed into a crystal structure, which we make in the lab. And we have tested them successfully. We can therefore make lithium move back and forth. We can make sodium move back and forth. But as you can see here, lithium is a small atom. So it's easier to incorporate inside uh, one of these structures. Sodium is a little bit harder. So we have some methods that we have used um, that, uh, to solve those problems. This picture is telling you that uh, in this, by, by this measurement, which is some years ago, we will reach a large, we will have finished about a third of the total lithium reserves very quickly. In fact, this, this has been revised to say that we will probably run out of it in about 10 years from now. And that revision is that as, as electric vehicles are becoming more and more popular uh, and hybrid vehicles, we might run out of it even sooner. So I wanna stop here and ask Bill, also a PhD student, Bill Rexhausen. So I wanted to tell us what are some of the challenges with charge cycling of either a lithium ion or a sodium ion battery? Bill. What are the challenges of it? What, do you what mean are some of the challenges yeah, in, in terms of you know, what happens to the cathode um, oh, yeah. so, structure and things like that. So if you repeatedly uh, cycle these batteries, you do eventually get a degradation in performance. And so the reason is that when you have ions moving into and out of the electrodes uh, repeatedly, every time that, that happens, there's some structural changes that happen because the energy landscape inside the, inside the electrodes is changing. So there's some contraction of the layer. So one thing to know about this is that these are layered structures. So the uh, sodium ions or the yeah the sodium ions or lithium in the 
case we've been talking about sits in between the layers uh, when, when it's in the electrodes. So also, as those move in and out, you get a little bit of a strain on the structure every time and over hundreds of cycles that can eventually lead to cracks forming, to uh, displacements happening and to a degradation of the performance of the battery. Thanks. And that's, uh, so there are two aspects of the way we invent these things. So we first figure out if it'll work and we understand the physics and chemistry of it and um, design, or we sometimes use the word tailor these materials so that they can work uh, in, in certain situations. And then we figure out these secondary issues like how many times can we cycle the battery before the structure that in which we put it, this crystal structure, which is basically made up of atoms uh, when the, until that you know, starts giving up. So these are some of the research things that we work on. Um, and I want to um, now bring in uh, Nilufar. And Nilufar, um, tell us a little bit, you also participated in the, in the NSF I-Core program and um, describe a few things that you learned, some interesting things that you learned during these National Science Foundation I-Core yeah. interviews. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I noticed that some of the companies do recycle batteries and recyclable battery manufacturing companies are desperately looking for people trained in this area. So you know that um, uh, we are getting out of the resources for materials. Eventually we will get out of the resources for materials on our planet. And also uh, because of the environmental issues, uh, green energy is a big thing right now. So they want to, some companies, they want to recycle battery. And uh, well, some of my own interviews ended up asking for PhDs trained um, in this area who might be willing to start jobs right away. So that was actually a good opportunity for me as a PhD student, I mean, PhD candidate close to my graduation to like work in this uh, companies because also I believe in green energy and I believe that we can do uh, a lot of things about that. So um, that's one thing you, I, I think the most important thing that I learned from NSF I Corps. Thanks, Thanks. Anifai. I'd like to repeat that NSF um, I Corps is a, is a program that's run through the uh, Lubar Entrepreneurship Center on, on campus here, and um, wow. an excellent way to, to train graduate students and undergraduate students about how to do what's called a lean launch of a technology. So we thank the LEC for that. And Nilofar, thank you. Uh, hopefully you will graduate very soon and find a job in the advanced manufacturing and advanced materials industry. I wanted to bring Marcus in, another uh, undergraduate student that is currently uh, on the panel. And ask you just an open-ended question. Tell us one or two things that you learned about from the i program. I think the biggest skill that I learned was just asking questions. It's very easy to um, kind of just, how do I say it? Not ask questions really. You know, it's it gave me a lot of confidence to um, just reach out to people, cold call, just send out emails to people who I may have never talked to, may have no connections to. And it was, I got a lot of fantastic interviews with a lot of interesting people out of it. Thanks, Marcus. Marcus is a first year undergraduate physics major um, and very interested in working on this problem. Um, he hasn't started working yet, but he will be starting this summer. Uh, he's been coming to meetings, but he has not yet started doing things in the lab. And we're looking forward to your having, having you here, Marcus. Alex, did you have something that you could share with us? Maybe a question if you don't have a comment. Well, I guess more at a, uh, the functional level. I was curious about the, um, the electrodes of the, um, based on what you, the electrodes you use for the, the sodium ions. Right, Maybe. and mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, that, that's, I mean, that's what I could think of so far. I mainly just focused on the, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, the so, uh, mm -hmm. Alex Evan is an undergraduate student also working in the lab on a different project. Um, 
and uh, Alex, um, I think he, he's in the third or fourth year, is about uh, in the 400 level courses of physics, also physics major. Um, and uh, the question Alex asked was, what do we do about the electrodes? Um, what kind of electrodes do we use? And so on the one end, we use cathode electrodes where we let sodium go in and out of those layers that, that are showing on the screen. On the other side, we could either use a sodium metal, which we can use a sodium metal because they're much cheaper than lithium, or we could use carbon on the other side. And um, in both cases, there will be degradation, of course, you know, no, no battery works forever. But the, one of the reasons that you can use a, you know, a foam battery for about a year or two, maybe a year before it starts to tell you that, you know, you can't keep a full charge for more than a few hours. Whereas when you bought the new phone, you could keep a full charge for, you know, maybe a whole day. And the reason is that it's degrading with this back and forth cycling. And that's another project that we are all working on to try and make sure that we can cycle more and more and more. Right now we have uh, several hundred cycles that we can do without loss of uh, stored energy, but we would like to get it up to several thousand cycles. So um, that's, uh, that's where we stand with this technology. Now, I, um, since this is also being run by the Lubar, this, this today, tonight's pre presentation is also with the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center and Brian is uh, here as well. I wanted to also mention that uh, there's a lot of interest that has been shown in this technology that we have, the sodium ion technology. So a local nonprofit wants to work with us um, and uh, help us set up a uh, um, manufacturing line uh, and two, non, two for profit companies, um, uh, one in Wisconsin, one outside uh, are very interested as well in working with us to get uh, funding from government also to put money into creating this, uh, helping our country go into more self-sufficiency when it comes to our energy future. So we are looking forward to um, uh, very good times, very, uh, very um, interesting times very soon. Hopefully we will all be using these more reliable materials. So I wanted to quickly switch to this, you know, continue this other point that rare earth oxides is another thing that we work on. Um, and the rare earth oxides, which is what go into a lot of the, the equipment that you use in the laptops and phones and cars and televisions and so on, we have been pulling those out of the earth as well, and we don't have a lot left of it. So hopefully my students and students who work in these areas will go forward and figure out ways to um, find um, you know, alternative met met methods by which to keep these running. Uh, this is another picture about you know, production of rare earth oxides. And you can find, you can see here that uh, China is where most of the production happens currently. Um, and uh, USA, not that much. And the rest of the world, so there's Australia, China, and USA, and the rest of the world is uh, very much at the bottom. So this is something that will not only benefit our country, but will also benefit the rest of the world, hopefully uh, the producers as well. So we are, um, uh, we want, to end the talk here with 44 minutes and leave this for questions. And uh, uh, a panel member could speak up or maybe Jean or Brian or any questions that have come in the chat. I have a question. Um, you, I'm wondering about what are the parameters that that ultimately people judge the quality of a battery. You mentioned, you know, how much charge it actually holds. You mentioned how long it holds it for. And you mentioned also at what rate it can give the energy back. Are there more parameters? Yes. Other than yes. what is made? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so these three things, uh, how, much, how much energy it can hold per weight of the material. So it's usually energy per gram. Um, second is, um, you know, how many times can we go back and forth charging and discharging with a battery and yet, you know, keep that much energy. The third, as you said, is how fast can we pull energy out of it in terms of an electric current? The other two parameters that um, are also important. One is how fast can we charge it? And this is something that's become even more important with electric vehicles, because uh, you know when you drive an electric vehicle into a charging station, currently they require eight hours 
or more to charge up to full. And, um, you know, that means you have to sleep there or stay wait there or have, you know, several meals before you can drive again. So if you're on a long distance trip. So charging rate has become very important. Um, and the other thing that's important is how many volts can, uh, can the battery do, uh, do the battery work at? So that is connected with, you know, how much current you can supply and so on. So that's something that many manufacturers worry about. Um, the higher the voltage, the more valuable the technology. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Gupta Sarma, thanks for uh, highlighting the I-Core program. As you know, in that program, we ask you to focus on risky assumptions if you're going to go out and talk to customers. And, and I, I want to credit you and your team, uh, all the students that really got out and experienced talking to people. It's really a powerful thing. My question for you or anyone, I guess, is um, about the risky assumptions, either on the business model side or on the technology side. What are the riskiest parts of this? What are the hardest things they're going to they're going to you know, in terms of getting this thing actually into batteries and adopted by companies and, and, the, and users? What, what are the risky assumptions here? I'm going to let one of the panel members respond to that. And if not, I will respond. Thanks for the question, Brian. Um, if I'll, I'll maybe prompt Heather to answer that. What are the riskiest assumptions that um, you think we have? Um, I think, like I said earlier, my assumption was that <clears throat> money was going to, to rule everything. And if we walked in and said sodium's way cheaper, that that is, that was what would turn people's heads. And I was, um, very surprised that right now the business is not running on money. It is running on lead times and the supply chain. There are very few companies that dig up the lithium. There are very few companies that have the battery technology to sell batteries. And so it is, it's all about how quickly we can get it. And if you don't have a manufacturing plant, we know that you can't supply all the batteries we need. And so we have to go somewhere else. Thanks, Heather. Bill or anyone else? You know, what um, are our I, risky assumptions? Yeah, I'd say the risky assumption would be that would be the idea that uh, el eliminating cobalt or any other kind of socially focused uh, thing that we're doing is going to be something that sways people one way or another. Like if that's, if all else is equal, whether that's something that we can use to get our foot in the door or if we actually have to be better at performance before we can get people to uh, pay attention. These are definitely two of the riskiest assumptions that we we believe, you know, as stewards of planet Earth, uh, and people in this room believe that we need to make sure that we uh, that we rather we we assume that people would care about things like this, and we found that that yes they do care but not that much, um, and that performance rides first, um, cost probably second. And as, and as Heather just said, cost is not as much because right now there's a huge demand and there's a shortage on supply. So people just want whatever they can lay their hands on at whatever cost. And um, so the one thing that one would put third is this, the, the assumption that we would say is risky, but maybe will work out is the sustainability that the sodium can be found anywhere on earth. And that might be the one that will win. Uh, in the end, and finally, the cost being much lower, but maybe the not the cost as much in the beginning. Other comments to either Jean's question or Brian's question from anyone on the panel? Um, one of my last interviews for i was uh, with my sister who is in environmental science. And uh, I guess one of the risky assumptions is that um, what would happen with a change of sodium levels. Uh, so if we're taking sodium from one place and putting it in another after the batteries expire, you know, what kind of impacts will that have is also, uh, we have to work out that infrastructure as well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an important one. So we, we pull sodium out of, you know, water streams and the ground and so on. If we pull too much, and I don't know if we'll ever get there, but we could cause other issues. 
because the sal salinity or sal salinity of the water has uh, many geoscientific, geochemical um, outcomes. So that's a potential risk, not, not risk in terms of the um, of, of launch of, of, of this product, but a risk to the earth. And how about on the technology side? Um, you've shown that you can make these in the lab. Uh, I know some of the battery technologies have a, a challenge in scaling, going from nanograms to micrograms. Uh, is there anything about the, assuming you can get it to work in the lab scale, getting that into the market is a very different thing. Are, have you even had a chance to sort of think ahead about the, the scaling and the technology risks yet? Yes, so we happen to be, um a lab that can that knows how to scale materials. Um, we have several methods that we've used in the past, which we by which we can switch easily from grams to kilograms. Now, going to metric tons is, is another game. Um, and hopefully that will be a good problem to have right when we go to metric tons. Um, but in principle, the, the same methods would be used, which we have used to go from grams to kilograms, so you would use the same thing and just scale that up. Um, we have not yet gone to the point where we are able to supply metric tons um, or uh, haven't taken some of our other materials in the past into that, that stage. Um, so that's not one of our, our problems. I think maybe the, I think technology-wise, you're asking the question of, where are the um, difficulties? And some of the difficulties are that if you take the fact that lithium ion, I, the idea of using a lithium ion battery has been around for the past 20 years, actually, I think first was seeded in, 20, in about 25 years ago. You know, if you ask what have people been working on over the past 20 years, and especially last five to 10 years, it's those little things working around the problem, you know, tweaking the electrolyte a little bit, tweaking the anode a little bit, and, you know, changing the, uh, um, maybe switching from a, an, a liquid electrolyte to a solid electrolyte, those little tweaks, which uh, we would say engineering tweaks that have slowly increased the capacity and the efficiency of lithium ion batteries. And that's what our, I think I see our main challenge to be where we need to speed that up very quickly. What took 25 years or 20 years? Well, I keep saying 25, but actually it's the past 10 years. We would have to do it in a, two to four years. So that's probably our main challenge, um, which is why we are hoping that our other value propositions are more valuable than that. Because if someone asks me, can you deliver 200 amperes you know, from your battery? Well, answer is yes, of course, but we have to design that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and not to speak of the number of people who have worked on it over the past 20 years, right? Um, and uh, so we will have to then work with other groups and other labs. There are not that many, I think, sodium ion batteries, a handful of groups around the world working on it currently, a um, handful of them even thinking about uh, commercializing it, but the com competition is increasing steadily because when we started uh, you know, doing work in the, in the lab about seven years ago, there were, I don't know, maybe, five to 10 papers in the field um, actually using these materials. Uh, that has increased in number to hundreds. And so there is, we need to work fast. It's not easy for a university lab to do that, um, especially because we often, you know, when we bring in a student and I'm talking about, you know, um, so when we bring in a student, the student has to be trained. So it takes time to train the student and then get to the point where the student is trained enough to be able to deliver uh, and very quickly between that time when the student is trained and the student delivers, the student graduates. And, and you know, that's one of the challenges of, uh, challenges of university research. So um, the way we get around that problem is to hire post PhD um, scientists who have already been trained and who can you know, get moving much faster. I have a much less technical question, um, but I was intrigued by the image of a teaspoon of lithium that you said couldn't be because it would catch, it would, it would, uh, I, you say catch fire? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I guess I have forgotten enough chemistry to not understand why that would be. Yes, um, thanks for the question. So lithium happens to be extremely oxidizable. So the moment lithium, uh, lithium has a one plus charge, it's a lithium plus that's moving back and forth. Sodium also is a sodium plus, one plus that is. So the moment it, it sees oxygen in the atmosphere, it wants to combine with that oxygen and form lithium oxide. And it, that, that reaction is a, uh, an energetic reaction. It, it, it is what's called an exothermal reaction. So it gives out heat. And that's basically what we see as fire. Um, essentially any fire that we do, for example, and this is obvious to anyone on, in this panel and to you as well, Gene, but maybe for the audience, when we burn wood, we are also causing an oxidation. We are, we are getting the carbon to convert into carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. So similarly, lithium, when it combines with oxygen, catches fire. Um, now, sodium also should, right? The question is, why wouldn't sodium do that? And the answer is a little bit of chemistry, maybe college chemistry here, that, uh, but I won't go too much into it. But because sodium is lower in the periodic table, it doesn't catch fire so easily. So it is a much slower process and much less exothermic. Uh, however, if you dunk sodium into water, then it catches fire right away. Uh, I mean, but it's, it's a much less, less exothermic reaction. So it's much easier to make these things in the lab because we don't really need, when you're making a lithium ion battery and using lithium, we need to keep those in extremely oxygen poor atmospheres. So that it needs very high tech, high uh, expense labs to grow them, to build them in. Where sodium, because it's less oxidizable um, and less flammable, uh, it's possible, to, we don't have to have those very expensive atmospheres in which they, these are grown. So that's the, that's the matter of the flammability. So, Great, thank uh, you. For those here um, in, the, in the audience who might have forgotten their chemistry, lithium has a positive charge. So it, is, it wants to get an electron from somewhere because everything in the world wants to reach charge neutrality. Um, so lithium combines with oxygen. Ox oxygen delivers a charge to lithium. Actually, oxygen has two extra electrons. So oxygen combines with lithium becomes charge neutral, and that's the process that it goes through. Uh, to um, Carbon does not do that. I mean, if you keep a piece of wood on, 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 on your table, it doesn't catch fire because it is not uh, you know, looking for electrons like that. But if you increase its temperature or start a reaction, uh, then the whole thing then reacts and forms carbon dioxide. Thank you for that question. Victoria, any questions from the audience or any questions that anyone else has? I don't see any questions from the audience. I'll just um, point out a reminder that if you thought of a question that you'd like to ask, um, you can click the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in your question there. And for those who are, uh, might be hesitating to ask questions, maybe you are a student or maybe you're a member of the community, um, feel free to write to any of us. Uh, my email address is pg at uwm, the, my first and last initial uh, at uwm.edu, uh, or write to Brian and Jean, we're all on the web, easy to find, and they will direct the question to the right person. Uh, funny thing here is that pg is my email address and also my name. I might be the only person on campus <laughs> who was called, and actually I'm called by most people as PG. So I, you know, my, my name is also my email address. Uh, I'm very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Uh, they don't let you take those emails anymore. They don't let you choose. They yeah. don't let you choose anymore. I would so love to have chance. VR at uwm.edu, that would be great. VR, VR would be great, virtual reality or mm -hmm. <laughs> something like That's that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, that tells you how long ago I came to campus. I came here 20 years ago, approximately uh, 21, I think. And uh, at that time, emails were just starting up. And so they were like- <laughs> They were like, we'll let people choose. <laughs> yeah, they just let us choose, yeah. Um, I just realized it's eight o'clock, so I'm, I'm gonna, Keep, give a quick plug to anyone who's interested. We have a virtual stargazing event tonight on a different platform. I'm gonna put the link in the chat. Um, if anyone's interested in hopping over to that, which will be, it'll be starting in a, you know, now in a few minutes. Um, 
And that's a, that's a collaboration between different observatories throughout Wisconsin, um, including Yerkes and um, Badger Boulder, somewhere in Madison, and also the planetarium. Uh, and you can either see live feeds of, the, of things that telescopes are pointed at, um, if the weather's cooperating, or else we will kind of just show you the photos from previous nights or show you around the platform. So I'll put the link to that. While you do that, um, since we're at a we're at eight o'clock now, um, I would like to thank so much BG for uh, orchestrating this beautiful panel. It was wonderful to hear from um, the students, the PhD candidates, but also the surf students. I appreciate that everybody took the time and we all realize how busy this time of the semester is. So it's very nice to hear from, from the people who do the work and mm -hmm. who try and find solutions um, that you know, benefit us all. So thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Brian, also for um, supporting this um, <laughs> with the i program. And um, I do look forward to our next um, talk together. Thank you, Jean. And thank you, Brian. Thank you, Thanks to all my panelists. Jean, a wonderful director of the planetarium has changed the entire face of the planetarium and what it does here on our campus. And uh, Brian changed the entire face of commercializing things on our campus. So both very, very impactful and valuable members of our campus. And thanks to all my students, some of the smartest people that I've met. <laughs>